In the interview today, Lord Mark Melloch Brown, President of the Open Society Foundations. We want to talk about the decline in democracy and human rights and how to stop it. Mark, over two billion people will go to the polls this year in local, regional or national elections. Given this, the expectations with regards to the outcome of these elections, are you worried where we will be at the end of the year? Well, it does seem to be a year where there are more elections involving more people going to vote than ever before, but it comes at the end of 20 years of steady annual democratic decline. So, you know, we could end up with a year of a record number of elections and a disappointingly less amount of democracy. Uh, and it's, that's a strange place to be because these elections take place at a time of huge crisis in the world. We've just come off the hottest year in world record. Uh, people being killed in conflict has reached to numbers we've not seen since the 1980s. Uh, we are seeing uh, extraordinary breakdowns of, of law, uh, of the law of conflicts with civilians being targeted, uh, with human rights being pushed back in many countries in many spheres. So that might set you up for a set of elections which would bring real change, that failing incumbents would be ejected and bright new leaders who spoke for these frustrations and problems. So change elected. for the better or for the worse? Well, you might hope it would be for the better, but to be honest, uh, when you look at the likely forecasts for each of these elections individually, what you see is a much more disappointing pattern. There will be elections, like in my own country, the UK, where in a fairly traditional way, it's likely that a long-standing incumbent government gets replaced by you know, a fresher, newer opposition. But you know, in other places, you've got Russia, where Putin will face no serious opposition. You have India, where you know, Prime Minister Modi is doing remarkable things in many ways, but is no friend of human rights, and yet seems cruising through to a big victory. And you've, above all, got the drama of the United States, where you know President Trump has just won the first uh, caucus uh, vote in Iowa uh, in a dramatic fashion, setting up an almost certain contest between him and President Biden in November. And you know, I, I think this doesn't exactly suggest the fresh generational change of leaders around the world that you might hope the situation merited. So are there countries which give you particularly cause for concern where you say, I'm very worried about the possible outcome in this country, for example? Well, I think one has to begin with the United States because the US influence globally is so significant. It has remained such an important leader for good and sometimes for bad uh, in the world uh, that you know its democracy, perhaps coming off the rails in November, is key. I mean, we've done polling as uh, Om Sati, which shows that two thirds of Americans are worried there will be violence around uh, the election. And, you know, there is plenty of polling evidence that neither side will accept uh, the result if the other side wins. We have a dramatic breakdown of trust in the American body politic, a massive polarization, and one side threatening to overrule the law do anything it takes uh, to impose its will going forward. So it's a very dangerous place. Um, but you know, there are other elections too where we will see in the European parliamentary elections, you know, a huge cross-country exercise. You know, the current polling suggests that there will be a surge in hard right votes and an incremental increase in, in, in center right votes, and that the center and left is likely to get, you know, quite a cold shower in those elections. Well, you know, if it was just a swing from the center left to the center right, you know, nobody would worry. I think these are all groups that respect democracy and its and, and the rules of democracy. But you know, there is continuously now the the risk in 
both national European situations as well as at the Europe level, uh, that we're going to see, you know, authoritarians sitting in the parliaments. To the right, to the left, or to the right? Well, I mean, this particular focus is to the right, but let me be clear, I don't think that the right has a monopoly of extremism. You know, we're seeing on the left too, on university campuses as well as in politics, you know, a lot of sort of dogma and extremism and failure to kind of build consensus and compromise with other groups. So, you know, this, this issue of polarization, you know, is, is, is across politics. What kind of strategies do you suggest as the Open Society Foundations to counter illiberal tendencies? Well, we were a foundation, set of foundations which grew up in the latter years of the Cold War, where our early grantees and recipients in uh, Central Europe particularly, but also in the old Soviet Union, you know, were people who had fought for the right to free speech uh, and potentially a right in future to vote. And so, you know, we had a kind of classic human rights and democracy mandate, uh, give people the vote, secure their human rights under the law, and the rest will take care of itself. And the history of the last decade or so has been the rest doesn't take care of itself, that people remain in polling of ours and others, you know, remain very much committed theoretically to democracy, but in judging their own governments and how they're going to vote, much more understandably driven by issues around their own and their family's security. Have they got jobs? Are those jobs threatened by waves of illegal immigrants? Have they got access to affordable health and education? Is the cost of living accelerating beyond their means? And you know, it's these sets of immediate uh, quality of life, uh, security of life issues, and pocketbook issues, which, you know, determine voting. So if people vote for, you know, an, an apparently authoritarian government, it doesn't mean that they're endorsing authoritarianism over democracy. More often than not, they're throwing out an incompetent incumbent who might be democratic but hasn't delivered for them. And so, you know, I think we've got to see behind the sort of argument of political philosophers around rights and democracy and, you know, shore up the effectiveness of government because that's the best way for democracy to prevail is when it's listening to people and delivering for them. And do autocrats deliver better results in the end? In the end, no. Uh, for a while, perhaps. Um, because, you know, they're able to uh, apparently sort of prey on uh, the shortcomings of government and, you know, a little bit like Caesars in the past promising bread and circuses, you know, offer uh, some Im immediate sort of tax cuts or, you know, promising to stop Im immigration or some other things which, you know, are pledges which stand up well uh, for the m short months of an election campaign, but in government often prove much harder to deliver. And the sort of thing about authoritarianism is it tends not to come with a governing philosophy, you know, other than tearing down what was already there. And so it very usually lacks the sophistication of policy delivery to really address deep-seated problems like shortcomings in an education system or a health delivery system. And so, you know, my own, and, and it also doesn't have the seeds of its own renewal in it because, you know, it doesn't respect elections as a means for, for you know, knowing when it's time's up and it's time for the other lot to come back into power. And so, you know, over time it is, it will prove a set of failed doctrines. But, you know, the difficulty is uh, the risk, you know, a risk that, Donald Trump has spoken to in the US, for example, of you know winning an election, but then tearing up 
so many of the sort of soft rules of democracy and practices of democracy that by the time the next election comes round, the media is not le is is less free. Uh, courts have been stuffed with you know pro-Trump judges. Uh, state rules have been rewritten in ways that limit the effective franchise. And so there is a risk that authoritarians get into power and then pull the ladder up behind them uh, to make sure nobody can clamber up and replace them. But if you look at the situation in Hungary, for example, then autocrat has been elected and elected again. So obviously people are not so dissatisfied with him. So how do you explain it? Is probably democracy not really that what people want so much anymore or understand? Well, you know, there's, there's, first there is no reason why a uh, Democrat, I mean, rather an authoritarian, you know, can't uh, deliver over a quite sustained period of time, uh, you know, government services which ultimately keep people satisfied. You know, I think the problem with Orban is in Hungary is he's nevertheless, he's in an hourglass and the sand is slowly running out for him. And he's managed to sort of, if you like, delay that moment of truth with the electorate by, you know, finding very sort of tempting red bait issues uh, which appeal to his culturally conservative uh, electorate around abortion rights, uh, around the treatment of the Roma, uh, around uh, other issues of that kind. So, you know, I think it's very proper to respect Orban's political skills and uh, success in, you know, mobilizing that socially conservative constituency while also pointing out that he's got a bad habit of a rash of election spending. His sort of bread, bread and circus model just before elections, uh, which makes people forget the relative economic hardship they'd enjoyed in the rest of that term. So, you know, he's a, a past master of uh, both, you know, um, you know, all the techniques of modern politics from gaslighting your opponents to uh, dog whistling them uh, to using short term government spending uh, to, 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 to sort of buy you another win at the polls. What would be a positive outlook of all the elections we've been talking about in 2024 look like for the democracy from your point of view? Well, it would be, you know, a set of elections where, you know, popular concerns did cut through in a way that politicians heard and responded to, because this is a world of mounting crisis and hence our challenged politics. But to come out of the year, you know, with a series of disappointing results would be just that disappointing. But, you know, democracy has shown an extraordinary habit to surprise, uh, to suddenly produce that extraordinary young leader who is the right woman or man for the moment. And, you know, I think we shouldn't go into this, you know, with our minds set that the year has to end uh, with a set of bad results. Um, you know, politics is a horse race. Uh, and um, sometimes uh, the long shot horse wins. And, you know, so I hope we should all go into the year as really concerned citizens uh, with our eyes on the race and, and cheering on uh, the exciting underdogs. Okay. Thank you, Lord Malach Brown, for this interview. Thank you.